It's April 2022, and this is Core Talk, the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers official podcast. I'm Andy, your host, inspired to send you the people, programs, and projects happening in Virginia, the Chesapeake Bay Area, and beyond. In this month's episode, I am proven so very, very wrong. And you're probably thinking, what? No way. But yes, I am not the oracle for all things Army Corps, which is why, probably why, I host this podcast. Anyway, let me give you all the background. I'm talking about timber harvests and how cutting down trees in the Raystown Lake area of Pennsylvania is critical to the environment. Now, that sounds counterintuitive, right? Yeah, that's what I thought, too. So we're going to listen to Alicia Palmer, the natural resources specialist at Raystown Lake Project, Glenn Warner, the forester at Raystown Lake Project, and Andrew Willey, who we actually, it's fun, we call each other the other Andy, uh, who is a forester in the real estate section of the Norfolk District. Let's hear them explain. I have to introduce this segment by saying that I don't think Andy has ever like contacted me so excited about something, ever. And and so just just your response, Andy, and, and what you were saying, like, hey, did you see this? Like you could just you could just feel like this was something big. Tell our listeners a little bit about no, tell our listeners all about this project that you have called a, the gem like project for, for 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 a forester. I was thinking about Raystown Lake and just we've done a number of activities up here primarily timber sales and often i see the the front end work comes to me i get to see the timber harvest active i don't often get to come back and and see the sale immediately after cut but do loop back around and and see post harvest conditions and it it really is a, a a gem or from your words a gem like I've never been to Raystown. Like, tell me, and Glenn, maybe I, I can post this to to when you guys on the Baltimore side. What is Raystown Lake? Where is it? What is it? Why is it such a big deal? So Raystown Lake is a U.S. Army Corps project. We're a flood risk management project, um, which is the primary purpose. But I would say the other second, probably to that, is recreation. We have a huge recreation program here. Um, we have boat launches, swim beaches, picnic pavilions, camp loops, uh, hiking trails, designated biking trails, pretty much have everything you'd, you'd want in a recreation project. Um, and then we also have the environmental stewardship program, um, which is kind of what we're, we're hoping to highlight here. So it's, it's one core project, um, kind of three elements, covers about 8,000 surface acres of water, and roughly 21,000 acres of land. Um, So a pretty decent sized project. Um, So there's there's definitely a lot to do and see here. It's located in Huntington County, Pennsylvania, sort of in the south central part of the state. Um, We're pretty localized to most of the big cities worth within driving distance of Pittsburgh, Philly, DC, Baltimore. Again, Raystown Lake being the, the gem, is truly that just they have a forester on staff which is a huge benefit to implementing such a project and they have the folks uh, on the biological side doing the front end work alongside with their forester and it's a great story to tell because i think a, a lot of visitors come here to raise town for recreation um there they see some timber harvest and they see management land management going on but do they know why or can we can we maybe tell that story to them as to why so you have this sounds like a pretty freaking awesome uh, air you know beautiful area for recreation for a lot of people so how does this play into the whole like let's connect this awesome area that falls under the baltimore district and the timber harvest how how are these two things related and anybody can answer that question I'll just start out, Andy, is that the the objectives in their master plan identify timber harvest and identify these activities for for land management. And the segue from from Baltimore to Norfolk is it, you know, timber being considered real property, 
being standing timber uh, becomes a real estate item at that point. And being under real estate, that's that's our involvement. But I'll flip it over to Baltimore. They they can speak a lot more to answer your question. So the obviously the recreation side is is the side everybody sees. That's that's what people come to Race Town for. That's what they're gonna see. Um, a lot of what we do in the environmental stewardship program is located in remote areas of the project that are not within view of the lake or any large recreation facilities. So a lot of the visiting public may not ever see what we're doing, or if they do, they wouldn't recognize it. Um, we try to, I don't wanna say we're trying to hide anything, but we're trying to make sure that what we're doing is aesthetically pleasing to the recreational user. Um, whereas the sale that we're going to, you know, try to highlight here, um, the drumming grouse timber sale, uh, is sort of an in your face type hay sale. I mean, when you enter seven points, which is the heart of Racetown, uh, when you crest the hill to enter, the first thing you're going to see is the timber sale before you get to the entrance station mm -hmm. to check in. So we want people to know what we're doing. We want to tell the story. We want to educate them on why we're doing it and why it's important. And that's where, like, I, I think we are, Glenn said it, we're behind the scenes so often, but here we are, we're sort of, we're sort of out there in the front and it's just a great opportunity to, to tell a little bit more out of this small widget as to what we do more or less across the, the landscape. So great, great bit there. So I have, a, I have a couple questions because I'm going to tell you, I, um, I had to go up to, Northeastern Pennsylvania the other day to visit some family and I see uh, trees being down, you know, for uh, future construction. And immediately I get like, like, I don't know, is something in me, the environmentalist in me is like, that's bad. You know, that's my default. And I think a lot of us kind of like, wait, you're, you're chopping down trees dispel that make me make me not get angry tell me why why this is a good thing uh, hi andy it's Alisa <laughs> talking um yeah so i mean i was that same kind of person you know um in college and growing up you know you see such a drastic change in the environment um and it's it's definitely alarming, but there's so many benefits behind it. And, you know, over the course of hundreds of millions of years, there's always been natural disturbances in the environment, whether it be, you know, hurricanes or wildfires or just in general wind, you know, big storms. Um, so there's always been natural disturbances. And, you know, as environmental stewardship managers, we're trying to mimic a lot of those natural disturbances because there's so many different species that are of greatest conservation um, in need that rely on those type of young forests. And essentially the grumming drouse uh, timber sale that Glenn was mentioning is specifically for to create a young forest, uh, right? So we're targeting those species, those 65 plus bird, man, mammal, reptile species that are in decline. Um, so you think of the big, the big three right off the bat that a lot of people know about are the American woodcock, the rough grouse, and the golden wing warbler. There's a lot of uh, big pushes uh, for environmental stewardship land managers to do those types of forest management techniques. Um, to improve the habitat for those three particular species, but there's so many different other species, uh, indigo buntings, um, you know, so many different types of warbler species. Um, there's different mammals like bobcat and different types of cottontails, reptiles in particular. Um, you know, there's tons of snake species like the black racer, rat snake, timber rattlesnake, and even, believe it or not, the eastern box turtle does very well after a really but um wow. so yeah, there's there's a lot of different um when you see it, definitely dramatic, but um after a year of seedling growth, you know, you're 
you're starting to get more cover for the, these species. Right after the cut, you know, you're getting a lot of seed dispersal, so you're getting a lot of food. A lot of the down limbs and the trees, um, you know, they start decaying, so you have your anthropods, you have a lot of food and cover immediately after a timber, a timber sale, such as the drumming grouse. I never thought about that. I've never thought that there would be certain species that would thrive on in that environment where there is new growth. And it's, you know, man, the, the, the environment's amazing, isn't it? Like, it's just, it, it's like, it's resilient and it's yeah. gone through over these changes over, you know, from glaciation all the way until now. I mean, the forest, what's nice about it is that forests regenerate. And so we are essentially, you know, getting a forest to regenerate and making for better habitat for forests that are just, you know, they're not really common. We have a lot of forests that are, you know, old growth or they're like the middle stage. So and, and to go back to what Alicia said, I really liked. She said mimic. And, and that is exactly where the forester can step in. And I'm kind of I'm stealing Glenn's thunder here a little bit. It's the it's the silviculturist. <laughs> In the forester, it's that applied method of how they're going to carry forth with a prescription to treat the land. So the type of harvest that we're going to do that will give us the mimicked condition that we're to, that we're shooting for, our desired goal. Um, so that's the really cool part. I'll let Glenn speak. I, I don't want to take yeah. his thunder. Off, but... There's so much thunder. There's thunder to go around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Glenn. I, I don't think, you know, I don't think you or anyone else is wrong for feeling that way. And I mean, a lot of it has to do with, with, you know, where you grew up and what you grew up around and what you're used to and, and the understanding of it. You know, I, I grew up in a logging family, so I've been around timber sales and, and forest management my entire life. So it gives me an entirely different aspect than, um, you know, maybe someone from a more urban area that has never really seen or understood a timber harvest or why we're doing it. Um, you know, but we're not as, as you say, as foresters, Andy and I, we're not just running out and just chopping down trees willy nilly with no thought or assessment of, of what we're doing or the repercussions of it. Um, before, before we can even start down that road of doing timber sales, uh, there's a whole stack of paperwork that we have to get through. So, um, speaking from a race town perspective you know we have a cultural resource management plan we have to consider uh historic sites and the impact on those and those have to be protected we're doing uh nepa um, environmental compliance seeing if there's any permitting uh stuff that's needed uh, erosion and sedimentation control we're doing uh plans for those that the contractors have to follow um, threatened and endangered species we have to do pndi searches um, for those T and E species, um, which race town has, um, which led us to formal consultation with fish and wildlife. So we have a biological opinion that we have to operate under. We have a forest management environmental assessment that meets our NEPA requirement. Um, so there's, there's a lot that goes into this, um, before we're ever able to get out on the ground to ensure that we're, we are protecting and considering all the resources on the land base. Um, and then, and then we get out and actually start doing the the good work. And, and I would say that a, a lot of the stuff you may see, um, may not be proper forest management or, or silviculturally, silviculturally sound, uh, timber sales, uh, because there is still that thought that, you know, a lot of landowners are just what they term high grading. So they're just cutting the best to receive the highest revenue they can and that's the only thing they're concerned about um when we're out here doing sales on on you say slans uh we're looking at a whole list of goals um, and how we can achieve those goals based on studied and practiced uh management that has been seen to succeed so there's a lot of thought that goes into the sales um and of course a lot of benefit that comes out of it like alicia was talking yeah. So you guys, you, so you're more, uh, you're less tree cutter and more tree hugger than I guess. Is that fair to 
I always tell people. I always tell people. I, I hug every tree that I cut. Oh <laughs> man, that's Cause awesome. Because te technically, I mean, we're out there tallying them. Um, <laughs> best way to find the volume is to measure the DBH, and you got to hug it to get the tape around them. So. <laughs> Yeah, just oh God! See, there, there you went. You just took my little happiness and just <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That's so. So when you say does um, the harvest, you guys follow extensive. Ex I mean, there's a lot of research. There's a lot of thought put into this, and that. The, I just want to make sure I'm getting it right. That isn't necessarily true for maybe other companies that do it do they not or is there a set protocol within the industry to do these such things or how does would, it work outside of uses i would just rephrase that andy it that's partially just partially true i mean we have a federal subset of rules that apply to management of our lands and and timber harvest uh if you were to go to a state sale well they're going to have their state rules and and we do follow the best management practices for forestry within the state we're operating in. However, we have this, this earlier stage of, of everything that Glenn spoke to for, for the environmental compliance. Um, so the state has their thing and then on, they're gonna enforce the timber harvests that occur on private land. So they would be responsible um, for that. Um, gotcha. It's just gotcha. a different set of rules, if you will. Um, what what we have to do, I would say, in general, is is under a bit of a heavier amount of front loading scrutiny before a single tree is cut per se. Um, but I thought I thought Glenn expanded quite well there. A few acronyms there that we may not all know. <laughs> we should know that. Wow, that sounds really important, and it, <laughs> it, is. <laughs> it certainly is. So uh, just just great great product for us to be able to reach after all that upfront investment and i can truly say speaking for them it's a lot of time and it's a lot of effort and there isn't much that goes unchecked that's for sure so when you guys after after the logging after the the timber harvest do you do you guys plant or do you kind of like how what's the process after a tree gets cut down i guess so uh, it, it's really variable between sites and, and what your goals are for that site. And, you know, maybe you have to consider what factors play into that. Um, you know, is it is it a site that's likely going to have invasive problems? Is it a site that you're specifically targeting one specific wildlife species that needs a specific plant community or, or habitat type? Um, there's there's a lot that you have to consider um post harvest and you know typically some practices that we typically use at Raystown um we're always monitoring invasive so almost every timber sale we do has at least one or more um invasive herbicide treatments just to try to not uh we're not getting rid of the invasives we're just trying to control them the best we mm -hmm. can to let mm -hmm. native species thrive and create quality habitat um we also do uh, tree plantings um, to assist natural regeneration. Um, we have done deer fencing in the past, um, although not recently, just because we have kind of dealt with that with that deer browse issue um, in other ways. And uh, we we're starting to incorporate a lot of interesting and and cool, I'll say. Uh, wildlife stuff that's mostly thanks to Alicia. So I can, I'll let her talk about some of that stuff um, that, that she's kind of led me to. <laughs> yeah. So um, the drum and grouse sale, you know, in particular was a great educational, um, I would say trail initially. So it's, it is right next to the old loggers trail. And the whole point of that trail was to, you know, highlight civiculture, you know, prescriptions. And that one in particular was for young forests. So, um, you know, Glenn just recently did that timber sale for drumming grouse. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of cool features about that area in particular. So with a timber sale, you know, a lot of, um, you know, snags or dead limbs are left, cavity trees are left. Um, 
they become, you know, perches for birds of prey or, you know, an opportunity to nest within that cavity. Um, a lot of owls, like screech owls, will nest in cavity trees. Uh, also, an, a cool feature about drumming grouse is there was an actual vernal pond in that area. Um, and given that it was a vernal pond or any type of stream or waterway, there's a buffer um, that's just supposed to be left. And there was a buffer left in that area. Um, what was the question? <laughs> we're actually, well, to, to touch more on vernals, yeah. um, that's something that we're actually incorporating oh, into yeah, yeah. our timber sale program. So post harvest, oh, yeah, yeah. we're actually considering going out and creating these vernal pools in our timber sales because we have seen how beneficial they are to a lot of reptiles and amphibians. And the other thing we're doing is um, creating these turtle mounds. So we're providing nesting habitat for, for turtles. And coming from a forestry logging background, the vernal pool and the turtle mound ideas is something <laughs> completely foreign to me. Um, but I've seen how beneficial it is and the success that we've had with them. Um, you know, it's important that we as land managers consider all species out there um, on the land base. Yeah. So, so what's, a, what's a vernal pool? So a vernal pool is a, um, it's like a ephemeral uh, water um, pothole that generally is in, you know, dense forests or at the edge of woodlands. And it's ephemeral in that it is generally just full of water in the spring and sometimes in the fall. So in the summer months, it's completely dry and it's a breeding ground for a lot of your um, you know, salamanders, um, and frogs. Oh, so very, this, very stagnant yeah. water. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. And why it's important for, um, salamanders as frogs is, uh, there's no fish in there, right? So the fish generally eat a lot of eggs, um, for food. So these little vernal pools throughout the forest landscape are very important for, you know, those breeding grounds for all these special uh, species. And the one in particular at Drumming Grouse has uh, Jefferson salamanders that are breeding in there, which is pretty uh, spectacular. So another thing that we do, um, we put up nest boxes occasionally as well uh, throughout, you know, after a timber sale. So we'll put up, you know, a barred owl box or a screech owl box. Um, you know, northern flicker boxes are something that we're experimenting with as well. So the turtle mounds are, are definitely something that's kind of new in the wildlife field. You know, there's the turtle species in general are facing threats due to a lot of road mortality and pet trade. So if we can create these, you know, mounds where turtles can lay their eggs and then in return um, protect them with cages, it just... Uh, creates like a better environment for them to reproduce. It's it's awesome to hear someone talk so lovingly about turtles and salamanders and screeching owls. Or like, <laughs> I appreciate that. That's awesome. <laughs> it's not a conversation yeah. you get to have uh, have a lot, you know, in my line of business. So we have we we've seen now we're talking about the environmental benefit. So what's the, um, with the sale part of it, I know that falls under a, a real estate. Andy, like, can you explain to me where does, if someone would ask, where does this, tim where's this timber going? Where are these, where's this wood going? That's a good question. We, we have these sales and we attract um, local area buyers. So they're, they're generally um, either a, a logging company themselves or they're a mill owner who processes the wood and they make, you know, different, different products from that wood. But in this area, it could, it could go off to be furniture or who knows um, a myriad of different products. But today we even Glenn and I were out on the sale and there was a product stacked up right at the log landing. That's where the log trucks would come in and load. And we said, you know, what are you doing with this? And then is it kind of leading the question to them, is this going as firewood? So part of that wood was being processed and sold as, as firewood. So uh, the, the real estate aspect of this is we're trying to attract a buyer for the timber sale. They're going to they're gonna pay the government for this 
for this wood. And we're going to facilitate that harvest action. We're going to administer it and be sure that they follow our contract, be sure that they follow all the provisions like the, the state best management practices for forestry. And the, the crazy thing is, is um, we go out there on the ground and we're, we're looking at this. And I mean, ideas are just flowing even during harvest. We're already, our minds are already seeing things towards the end product. Um, I know today, Glenn was looking at these younger yellow poplar left behind and it was like, hey, these, these will be great. They're gonna really respond to the more open conditions here post harvest. There's gonna be a lot more sunlight. They're gonna grow like, like crazy and they're gonna provide good shade and good food for the wildlife out there. We just see, we, we see the whole thing holistically. And I think if, if you could have been walking with us or standing over our shoulder, you would have just immersed yourself. <laughs> this is a lot of data and this is really cool stuff, but it's kind of like, what we do at this point we're just so comfortable with going out there and seeing the harvest um that that we're we're just taking it all in and commenting as professionals so you're helping the economy you're helping the environment like i think you've you three have successfully turned me from a hater into <laughs> a much more we hope so. we hope so. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we also all work for you say so you know there's that um, but <laughs> we should have the same goal, but no, that was, that makes total sense now. And I, uh, I think now it's the, the job of the communicators like myself to make sure that message gets out to people because that, that's, that's, that's right. Yeah. When, when people see, uh, an active logging site, or if they see a truck going down the road with, with this raw wood product on it, just. I guess take a step back and think about um, not only what is the end goal there, what is that making? Is that heating someone's home? Is that providing furniture or building material for a home? Um, obviously, those those come to the forefront when you see that, but what benefits does it give to the land and to the public? And I think you know, talking right here today with Alicia and Glenn and just exposing some of that is is huge. And that's exactly what, what we intend to do. That's exactly what needs to happen. Um, I, I'm a member of the Society of American Foresters and it seems like all the time we're we're trying to get the word out there about the good things that, that this does for not only our profession, but for people. We're, we're doing this for the public. Uh, especially on public land. So, and I think people are starting to understand forest management a little more now because we, you know, we wanted to do something to notify, you know, the visitors at Raystown. We get 1.6 million visitors a year. So, we put out a Facebook post a couple of weeks ago just to kind of highlight, you know, the basics of what's happening as you're driving into Seven Points. And believe it or not, we had a lot of positive responses from the post. The only few calls that we got and received were, are you putting in a development? They don't want to see a development. But as soon as we told them, you know, hey, we're doing this as a forest management um, practice. And they off right off the bat, they were like, OK, that's great. You know, <laughs> I, think, I think more people are, you know, becoming, you know, more into that kind of aspect of it. Sure. Yeah. And trying to, trying to, you know, just keep an open mind and, mm -hmm. and, uh, about the whole process. So I'm going to, I'm going to start with Glenn on this one. What is, what is something that you would want people to know, um, the general public to know about this specific project or about what you guys do that we haven't covered so far in this conversation? Oh boy. <laughs> That's a loaded question. It's easy. I mean, I think I think just we've covered a lot of it in this talk, but I really just in as a broad picture, just want people to understand what we are doing, um, what they're seeing, and the benefits of it. It's it's a giant circle basically of 
everything that has to fall in line and this mimicking of natural disturbance and that we are out here and the work we're doing is is not really devastation or destruction but we're actually trying to conserve and promote habitat and species of of decline primarily for this specific sale um that, that that's the primary goal um we're not out here uh looking at dollar signs thinking man we're going to get a lot of revenue on this one or or we're going to you know be able to pay for a lot of stuff with this sale um we're really just out there doing it for the management aspect um the, the revenue is really just an offset or, or side benefit um and the revenue that we do get uh, at Racetown comes right back to Racetown, and it all goes back into our land management program. Um, the timber sale revenue does not pay for any labor. It does not buy vehicles. Uh, it's all on the ground management. So it's anything that we're getting, we're putting right back into the program itself. And Glenn and I are going to do a great uh, wetland wildlife complex um, project here in the future. So. You know, we're going to use some of those timber sale funds to, you know, enhance some of the diminishing wetlands that we're seeing across the board. So it's re really cool to see. Yeah, it all it all partners together. And when I when I was listening to Glenn just moments ago, I was this really is ecosystem level management that we're talking about. So, you know, it's pretty broad scale, like he said, and I guess. Um, you know, I, I guess if we had some futuristic way to sever a tree and not pull it across the ground and have it, you know, reappear at the mill for processing, that might be an, an option. But uh, <laughs> current, currently, there is a process to do that, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It can be a little bit dirty. It, you have dirt. That That's what we're skidding our wood across is dirt. Mm -hmm. And that's that's going to be part of the process. But I will say, however, it's when I go out and see a job, I know kind of what's unacceptable. I know uh, a threshold and I know what looks pretty good. And often like today, sitting here in this chair, we've looked at two different sales. We looked at drum and grouse, which is essentially um, entirely cut out. We're just going to, the contract's still open. We're going to close out a few remaining items with that. And then we were at uh, the Spooked Fawn sale, which is a, at the south end of the lake out of the Saxton community. And we're there and they're, they're plugging along. We figure kind of like 40% cut out. And, you know, we're, we're just looking at the site conditions and we just wrap it all in full scope. I mean, maybe not entirely the entire ecosystem, but we're taking a snapshot of today and trying to apply it to this longer term, broader scope. And, you know, just again, a, a feel great moment for, for what we do in our careers. But um, I'll let you expand off that, Andy. Well, now I'm kind of like, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to ask Alicia this, the same question that I asked Glenn, though, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you want, that you want people to know? Or do you feel like we covered it? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, now that I've been working with Glenn for the last three or four years, you know, he's really broadened my, you know, mindset of, you know, what forest management is. And, you know, there's, there's so many different civicultural practices that forest, uh, you know, forest managers can do, but I'll never forget the one timber sale that Glenn took me to last fall. And, I mean, I'm I'm such a nature lover and especially a monarch butterfly lover. And with some of these, you know, timber cuts that Glenn is doing, there was like this amazing herbaceous, you know, vegetation epiphany where all these uh, snake root uh, herbaceous plants just bloomed. And there's this beautiful white flower and it was full of monarch butterflies throughout the forest so you were just standing there at the log landing and you're just looking up at the forest and below there's these beautiful white flowers and just monarchs all over the place so mm -hmm. you know i think you know it, it's it's really awesome to think of 
you know, we're managing for biodiversity, right? We're managing for all species, even, you know, the, the fungus and the bacteria, the animals, all the plants. So collectively, um, you know, we're taking some of these areas and we're trying to, you know, make them the best that they can be for wildlife. So. Oh, your mother earth. I, love <laughs> yeah. it. I, I think it's also cool because in this recent timber sale, you know, they found an American chestnut tree, <laughs> which was pretty cool. So part of what Glenn and I are going to do is we're going to plant some additional chestnuts in that same area. Um, so it'll be kind of cool to see what happens afterwards. Oh, wow. All right. Thanks for listening. The shout outs for this episode go to... Andy Willey, Alicia Palmer, Glenn Warner. And since April is the month of the military child, I want to give a shout out to my little ones, Ava and Temple, uh, whose strength and patience with me never ceases to be amazing. So until next time, this is Core Talk.